Good morning. I think there we go. Have you noticed that the, the stories of the media right now are completely focused upon this? It's no longer upon a lot of the tensions that were taking place before and, and the one side against another and, and hatred and anger and issues about different races and issues like that. Now, those things are still issues, but it's like God has brought in the forefront that this is no, this, this issue down there is, is an issue of, of life. It's not an issue of this party or this race. It's an issue of life. And it's an issue of taking care of those that are Americans. And it's not about Republicans, Democrats, or this or that. It's, it's about taking care of, of God's creation, God's people. God cares about people. I just feel like the focus, God has just shifted it. And, and you see the focus of even people on media saying, pray for those ones. And, and those on t uh, that are being interviewed say, thank you for your prayers. And uh, to me, it's awesome. It's just awesome how God has just redirected our nation through this tragedy. God is using, and he does use tragedy, right? For his purposes. And so I'm just so grateful. I, just a, another comment. There's another church that um, Amy and I, I've had a good relationship with. It's Peace with Christ Lutheran Church. Our kids actually used to go there when they were real young. And, uh, and we developed a really good relationship with the youth pastor there. The youth pastor, her name is Donna Patton. Um, she was on TV about three days ago that that church was actually sending out three and a half trucks that were donated to them by some company and all the supplies, food, clothing, and everything else was also given to them so that they could take it down to Texas. And they're there right now. And so we gave a donation from our church to uh, just wanting again to just be a part of the restoration process, physically, but restoration in the spirit for our nation. And so I'm just really excited how we were able to partner with them. Um, God's using it. God's using it. Let's just pray. God, would you use this even more than we realize, even more than we see, even more than we hear from, from the media? God, would you just show yourself strong? Show yourself as God. Show yourself as you are still on the throne and we can trust in you. God, reveal the love of Christ through, the, through those service workers, God, through those different agencies, through Samaritan through peace with Christ, through other churches that are down there. Uh, God, I just pray that there would just be a fire of God that would be unleashed upon the churches down there, even the ones that have lost their buildings in the churches. God, let it give them help and grace and comfort, but help them to be the light of Christ, the light of hope, a beacon of hope, God, because there is hope beyond this world, and that hope is through Jesus Christ and his sacrifice, and his love, his unending love for us. We give you all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Um, just before we start with just studying the book of Acts, um, in fact, why don't you, if you would, just pull out the, pull out the book of Acts um, don't rip it out of your Bibles, please, because I just realized that the way I said that was really awkward. So, uh, but open up to the book of Acts, if you would, um, chapter 8. You know, just before I share that, uh, start sharing about this, I just believe the Lord has given me a word for the church today, and I want to give it because I just, I feel really strongly that the Lord is saying this. And specifically, God is releasing hope today. He's releasing hope today. If you have been struggling with hope, I just believe right here, right now, God is releasing his hope. He's releasing to you a new just freedom, freedom from the worries, freedom about the future, freedom. 
He's given you freedom and releasing hope. Um, the scripture that I feel like the Lord gave me is in Hebrews, and it's the one that, that says, now may the God of all hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope as, by the power of the Holy Spirit. God wants us to abound in hope, but he's releasing it. If, if there's something in you today, you, I, just, I just feel so strongly about this that God is saying, I just feel like it was confirmed even with the prophetic word that, that Sarah Cook shared earlier, that speak the name of Jesus. When you speak the name of Jesus, it breaks shackles immediately. It is that powerful. God's name is powerful. And so I just pray, God, you would just release hope upon everyone here. God, release your strength. Release your, your, uh, your Holy Spirit that we may abound with hope as we believe in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Write it down. I just, I feel so strongly about that. I want to share one more thing about this because I, I feel like God gave this to me last night and I didn't know how it fit. And I didn't share this with the first service, but I feel like it's um, and particularly important for, the, for you guys. Um, there is a scripture in Acts 16, 16. It says this. As we're going to, a, to the place of prayer, as we were going to the place of prayer, this was the apostles, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. Remember this story? And then the apostles cast out that demon and they were um, getting some backlash, some persecution from those, um, those ones that were o the owners and making lots of money from it. But this spirit of divination that's spoken of, um, most Translations use the word spirit of divination, but some translations don't because, <clears throat> excuse me, because the, the actual Greek of this term is actually states it as a spirit of the python. You may have heard of a book that Jensen Franklin wrote called The Spirit of the Python, and I just feel like this is a significant thing um, in the Greek culture, the python was a very highly regarded animal and worshipped. But that spirit of the python, think about a python. A python, how does a python attack its prey? It's not with a, a big lunge and a, and a bite and a, and a venomous type of 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 injection into the body. It's, it's a wrapping around that starts out sometimes subtle and ends up just closing in and a little by little by little and tightens and tightens and really literally squeezes out the breath of life until the victim is completely dead. And I sense from the Holy Spirit that he um, is saying that there is some of you that have have felt this squeezing on your life. And the enemy has tried to get a grip from this spirit of Python um, spirit has come and tried to, to suffocate you and take away your hope and your breath. But you know what? This, any spirit, any demonic spirit is subject to the Lord completely subject to the Lord because God has all authority in heaven and earth. And so God, even right now, we just come by faith and we release that spirit. God, we curse that spirit, that spirit of divination, the spirit of Python, that, that, that all-encompassing, suffering, life-taking breath that comes from the enemy. We just, we curse it in the name of Jesus and we release upon the whole body here and everyone listening online, we release to you a spirit of hope and a spirit of freedom, a spirit of life that comes from the powerful name of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, so Acts chapter 8. 
Before I read a little bit of this, I just want to just quickly um, review. Last week, I spoke to you about security. Where is your security? Where do you place your security? Is your security in, the, in yourself, in your possessions, in, the, in others, in the relationships with others? And, and how do you respond to difficult situations? How do you respond um, when somebody that you rely upon reacts in a negative way? How are your emotions affected? These are all different ways to understand and get a barometer of where is our security? Think about your security. Stephen was one that certainly had his security in God. He trusted in God. You know, I, uh, I want to... Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip a couple of verses that I feel like the Lord gave me earlier, but I think that uh, just rearranging here a little bit. Let's read Acts chapter 7, starting with verse 57. And I'm going to read until um, probably the first part of 8, and then I'll, I'll con- make a comment and go from there. So starting with 57. So it says, Then they put their hands over their ears and began shouting. The they, this, the they is the religious leaders, the high priests, the the elders of the church at that time literally put their hands over their ears and began shouting because they did not want to hear what Stephen was preaching about. They originally were listening, but then he came back and and basically called them heathens and, and deaf and hard at heart. And they were upset. They rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. His accusers took off their coats and laid them at the foot or the feet of a young man named Saul. As they stoned him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He fell to his knees shouting, Lord, don't charge them with this sin. And with that, he died. Saul was one of the witnesses and he agreed completely with the killing of Stephen. You know, just make a couple comments and I'll read a little bit here in a minute. But the, the, the thing that just strikes me so much in this story about Stephen is that Stephen was one that he clearly um, first did not turn to another person, did not turn to one of the apostles, did not cry out to them and say, hey, Peter, John, help me. But who did he cry out to? Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. I mean, literally, it's, you can see by the text, I mean, there was a desperation there, and clearly he was facing the end of his life. But he called out to Jesus. When he was under stress, he called out to Jesus and not someone else, not trusting in anything else but Jesus. I love the picture of how God just opened heaven for him. I think it's because he was focusing again upon Jesus and not focusing upon the the problem, the complaint that he could have had, could have could have come from any one of our mouths. But his next response was this: he fell to his knees, shouting, "Lord, don't charge them with this sin." You know, to me that is a perfect picture of what intercession is about. That's intercession. Lord, don't charge them with this sin. This is a sin against him. How hard is it for us as Christians to to pray for our enemies? I want to bring up a question. Um, Bode, we were at um, the altar prayer ministry team meeting last week after church, And he brought up a question that I have just been chewing on all week long. And his question was, as a church, how do we become relevant to our community? How do we become relevant to the culture? How do we change the culture? See, in this scripture, in in Acts, the culture was being changed. People were being transformed. 
thousands of people were coming to Christ, it was affecting the religious leaders, but it was affecting other people too. All around, there was great effect upon the culture. This is what I believe God's heart is for us today is we are to affect the culture. Prophetically, what happened back here, God is breaking down the walls literally for us to affect the culture, to affect those around us with his word, with his truth. See, never in the, the story of Stephen from Acts 6, 7, and 8 did Stephen try to take care of himself. What he did was he tried to exalt the name of Jesus. He tried to expose the gospel. He tried to share it and even unto the death. You know, I, uh, I'm, uh, again, just really chewing on this of how to affect our culture. How is the church to affect our culture? Does the church affect the culture? Does our church affect the culture? Does the church in America affect the culture? This is, I believe, what God's heart is for us to affect it. It clearly does here. How do we do it? You know, I think that the church very easily can look like the world, act like the world, seek the things of the world, to where the church literally looks like the world. And that is the danger. It's the danger. I think it's a picture of the trash coming down the, the streets here and coming to, to just clean us up. God brought... God allowed, I'll say that, a devastation around this area. He's allowed a devastation down in the Houston area. He's causing a cleanup. God uses difficult things in our lives to expose what has value. God wants to affect the culture. How do we do it? You know, one thing, think about this question, but... What causes the church to look different than the world? What is different about the church? What causes the, ch the world to want to be like the church or to come to the church, to come to Christ? What is it? I mean, there's lots of different answers you can come up with that to, uh, to make the church look like something that's attractive. You know, and I think, honestly, this story of Stephen where he prayed for his enemies, instead of complaining, instead of getting angry, instead of yelling and, and covering up his ears or, or whatever it may be, he didn't complain. He prayed for them. I tell you what, that takes courage. That takes the Spirit of God. Only the Spirit of God can cause us to pray for those that treat us poorly for those that offend us, those that hurt us, those that are intentionally trying to take advantage of us. I want to encourage you today, if there is anyone in your life that has caused trouble for you, pray for them. If they have offended you, if you have held something in your heart, some unforgiveness, I just implore you, for you to be set free from that thing, you have to forgive them. See, if, if you hold on to something for them, trying to hurt them, it ends up hurting you and it ends up hurting the Lord because you represent God. And so you and me, let me put myself in that same bucket because I do. I end up causing my own issues by complaining, by arguing. You know, look at this scripture. This, this just hits me between the eyes. Do everything without complaining and arguing. I don't think any one of us could say, you know what? I've done that. I'm fine. <laughs> so that no one can criticize you. You know what? I've, I've had some criticism and it's rightfully so. I don't want to, but I am convicted of this scripture that God is saying not to complain and not to argue. That's a big deal. I don't see that at all in Stephen with this. He didn't complain and argue. That is a picture of someone that is trusting in Christ and they're not 
retaliating because they're being treated unfairly. Because you know what? Honestly, when we treat or when we complain, we're basically telling God that he's not doing his job. We're basically telling God that there's something wrong with him because God wants to use everything for good in us. That convicts me. You know, when I, um, when I think about Stephen and I think about myself, it's like I, I want to be more like him. He's a hero to me. You know, he gave his life, as Amy mentioned during the communion today. Jesus gave his life willingly, but Stephen gave his life willingly. And he gave it for the gospel. And you know what? The gospel's worth it. God is worth it. Putting ourselves out there as a living sacrifice, as we're memorizing, as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. That is basically saying, okay, God, just, just light me on fire. Take everything else away from me that is impure. Let it burn. Just take it away. And let it be a, a signal of, of who Jesus is. I mean, that's hard to do, but God wants us to be a living sacrifice because then it brings glory to him and it's not about us. You know, this is a strong message and it's a hard message, particularly when you consider persecution. Um, and this is, this is serious persecution that Stephen went through. If you have been persecuted... I'd just like you to be honest with me, if you would, and honest with those around you. If you feel like you've been persecuted before, for the gospel, for giving hope to someone, trying to help someone, trying to bring the light of Christ to someone, I would like you, if you would, just be honest, just lift up your hand. If you've ever felt that in some way. You know, let me read to you um, in Matthew chapter 5. This is starting in verse 10. It says, God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right. For the kingdom of heaven is theirs. There's great reward. God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. Be happy about it. Be very glad for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. You know, that's about the only, I mean, thinking about the rewards, thinking about how it blesses God, thinking about how it will honor him is the only way that we can get through persecution. You know, this is not necessarily a feel-good message, but I just believe that the Lord is saying that persecution's coming. We've faced it, some of us, and to some levels, different levels of varying levels. But God says that we will face tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. That's Jesus saying that. We will face it. We need to be prepared, and I want us to be prepared. You know, we have faced some persecution. We've faced some persecution even with this wall. We've faced some of it. But you know what? I am so, I just want to encourage us. I want to encourage Paul and Liz Medina, because Paul and Liz Medina, they're not here today, but they lead the young adults group. They were here when that wall was, was broken down. And they and their whole group went out to love on these people. They didn't go out there to berate them, to argue with them, to say, what's going on? I mean, they went out there. Tim and Lisa, you guys were here too. And you went to embrace them and went to talk to them. And some of them actually were standoffers and just said, leave me alone and walked away. Literally. But 
you know what? That is showing the love of God. I know Sarah Cook in particular was able to pray for the one that was the driver and then invited her to come to VBS, invited her to church and said, please use the front door. <laughs> but she showed the love of Jesus in the midst of being attacked. This is what causes I believe the church to stand and to be attractive to the rest of the world. When, you're, when you see someone that loves, when they're being treated terrible, it encourages you, doesn't it? It makes you love that person. It makes you respect that person. It makes you see that, that, that God is in that person. That's the only thing. When, someone, when we forgive someone that offends us or someone that, that takes advantage of us or someone that actually even goes further and takes life from us in some way, and, and forgiveness is offered, that's only from the Lord. That doesn't come from the world. We don't look like the world because the world doesn't have that to offer. Jesus has that to offer. He has that to offer for all of us. And so if you, just kind of in closing here, if you have received God's love and his forgiveness, you know what I'm talking about. You know that, how life-changing that is. It changes us from the inside out. And then it's like you're marked with Christ. You want to share it with others. But if in that case, it's like, I, I, I just want us to close with this. The worship team, come on up. But I want us to close with this. That, you know, every one of us is, is guilty of, of murmuring, complaining, of arguing, of of just feeling like life is not fair and then expressing it. God is wanting us to, to, to really look honestly at our own heart. Look honestly at where we have allowed our emotions to control us and not allow God and the Word of God to control us. So as we sing this song, I just want to encourage you, come honestly before the Lord down those sins that have so easily ensnared you, encumbered you. Come repentant before God. I also want to ask you if you just, before the Lord, would you consider making a new commitment unto God to be a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is God's will for us. Just honestly come before the Lord, just you.